is not preparation for the battle. Prayer is the battle. Two Sundays ago, when we began this 40 days of prayer, um, I challenged folks to consider going to our Facebook page and, and writing down a song that God might be putting in their hearts about what he's doing in their lives. And several of you did that. And some don't really have access to a computer or their eyesight isn't good enough to be able to do anything with it if they did. And uh, one of our dear ladies, Lois Schaefer, gave me a, uh, her song this morning as she walked in. And I want to start with this. This is not the introduction to my sermon, so this first 30 minutes will be free of charge. No. <laughs> Listen to what she said. Jesus, my Savior, my heart is full of love just for you. If we fail to get on our knees and pray to you, we will never know a love so true. You must look to the skies and pray to Jesus. Make it a loving thing to do. Pray, pray, pray. Not just once, but every day. Jesus is always with you when you're happy or sad. Jesus will hold you in his arms with love you never have known. A love straight from heaven, you will never be alone. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's what the 40 days of prayer is all about. It's about us connecting with God and inviting him into our day, every single day. If you haven't signed up yet to join us for the 40 days of prayer, make sure to do that on the contact card this morning before the offering plate comes around, and we'll get those to you. Um, you may miss a day or two, so we've got hard copies out in the, in the foyer, and today is day 15 of the 40 days of prayer. Let, let's pray together. Father, thank you for wanting to hear our prayers. Thank you for caring about what's happening in this world, and not just caring, but orchestrating it all, and then giving each of us an opportunity to be involved in what you're doing. Show us today what you want us to do. Help us to slow down long enough to hear your voice, to allow you to, to remind us that we're your child, that you love us, that you have a purpose for us, that you're already well pleased with us as you invite us to be involved in your work that day. Thank you, Jesus, for willingly coming and being the sacrifice for us. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for filling every one of God's people and making us the children that he wants us to be and helping us to live that way. In Jesus' name, amen. The rise of the nuns and the alarming rate of increase of those who self-identify as atheists has been one of the hot topics of debate in the last couple of election cycles. People are thinking that the culture in our country is changing radically, and I think they are probably pretty spot on. They've also been a source of main concern for those of us who are concerned about the souls of people, knowing that, that when we die, there are, there are really only two destinations. We will either go and be with God, or we will go and be separated from God in a literal place called hell. But as, as concerning as atheism is, there's another theism that I think every one of us must become aware of if we're not already. Because I think some of us have been virused with this theism. And if we've been virused with it, then, then, then we are carriers and we're probably infecting others with it. I am um, lifting this from an, an online subscription article that I get called Church and Culture. In, in this article, James Emery White um, comments on the first ever survey that was conducted in Great Britain on the state of theology. Now, in this survey, for a vast majority of some super important theological questions, the response of the British people is astounding. Questions like, there is one true God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Another question, 
Biblical accounts of the physical or bodily resurrection of Jesus are completely accurate. This event actually occurred. And a third question, God counts a person as righteous not because of one's own works, but only because of one's faith in Jesus Christ. Now, as, as believers in Jesus, how would you respond to each of those questions? Now, think about that. That's just core Christian doctrine. To not know those things or to not agree with those things says a whole lot about where you are spiritually. But you know the response of well over a third of the folks in Great Britain to each of those questions, and many like it, was, I don't know. I don't know. Emery uh, White says this, in fact, an article on the study con concluded that I don't know was the top response to numerous questions about Jesus, sin, the Bible, salvation, and other rudimentary theological concepts. And then a, a guy named Stephen Nichols, he's the chief academic officer for Ligonier Ministries and the president of Reformation Bible College, commented on this survey or the results of the survey. It's actually tragic when you look at the survey and you see so many saying, I don't know. These are not matters of just life and death. These are matters of eternal life and eternal death. There can't be any more consequential questions than the questions on this survey, and so these I don't knows are really troubling. Then an author in an article in the Atlantic Monthly described the conversation that he had about his own personal spiritual journey, his own personal spiritual understanding. He said, someone asked me about my religion. I was about to say atheist when it dawned on me that this really wasn't quite accurate. I used to call myself an atheist, and I still don't believe in God. But the larger truth is that it has been years since I really cared one way or another. I'm an apatheist. He then went on to describe his state. Let's see if you can relate to this with folks you know or feelings you've had maybe. Disinclination to care all that much about one's own religion and even stronger disinclination to care about other people's. But that's a little bit revealing because I think that describes our culture pretty well. Hey, you can believe what you want to believe. I'll believe what I want to believe. That's okay for you, but not for me. That's where we used to be. Now we are, hey, you can believe what you want to believe over there, privately. But publicly, no, 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 no. You can't have your beliefs here, because if your beliefs don't align with my beliefs, or the majority belief, then you, what you say and what you think doesn't matter, is inconsequential. I mean, think about the implications of that. But that is not the most disturbing thing that this, this young man wrote. This, I think, is super revealing. And, and I will tell you, it's very convicting to me. He said, I have Christian friends who organize their lives around an intense and personal relationship with God but who betray no sign of caring that I am an unrepentantly atheistic Jewish homosexual. They are exponents, at least, of the second more important part of apathyism, the part that doesn't mind what other people think about God. Now, James Emery White ends his article this way. He says... Sadly, this seems an accurate reflection of our day. In a U.S. version of the same state of, the, uh, of theology study, to the statement, it is very important to me personally to encourage non-Christians to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. A mere 38% of American evangelicals strongly agree. Now, an evangelical is someone who says, I believe the Bible is the Word of God. An evangelical says, I, I'm going to live my life based on what the Word of God says. An evangelical holds to the statements that I've read already. But only 38, that, that would be us, by the way. Only 38% agree 
that it's important that I make sure other people know about Jesus so they have an opportunity to trust him as their savior. I think that we have to really consider where we're at with this personally. Now, my purpose today is not to dump guilt on anybody. Instead, what I want us to do is I want us to think about why. Why don't I want to share my faith with somebody? What is it that's holding me back? Because I, I think it's not that we don't care about other people. I think there's something more profound going on. And I think the answer to the question, why don't I want to share my faith, is not that I don't care. I think maybe it's, it's a symptom. It's a sign that, that maybe we've been infected with apathyism. Maybe we've bought into some of what our culture tells us. Our culture says it, it might be okay for you, but it doesn't have to be okay for me. Your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. The problem is that the Bible says that there is one truth. Remember what, what John 14, 6 says? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And, when we, and we take that verse, and sometimes we throw it in people's faces, and that's not God-honoring either. Because biblical beliefs with ungodly behavior is still an offense to God. So when we think about how am I going to tell someone else about Jesus Christ, I think Jesus has the back answer to that in Matthew chapter 22. So turn to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to look at verses 38 to 40. If you're using the, the Pew Bible with you, it's in, uh, on page 692. And if you don't happen to own a Bible, please take this as our gift. I'll be following along in this one as well. 692, Matthew chapter 22. And in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 38, we read, Jesus said, um, sorry, we're in verse 37, not 38. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So the question of the greatest commandment was something that the religious leaders had been fighting about for years. They had parsed the Old Testament. They had discovered that, and from their perspective, there were 248 commandments that were, that were good commandments, positive things that you could do to, to, to love God, and there were 365 negative things, things that you wouldn't do because you love God. I mean, there's a negative commandment for every single day of the week. Anybody grow up in church and feel like that was, that was life? The negative commandment, I, this, that you, there's more that you can't do than what you could do? Well, that's the perspective that the religious leaders had. And they understood that these 613 commandments would be a little bit overwhelming for anyone to try to know, let alone live by. And so they divided them up into these two categories. And even beyond that, they divided them up into, into heavy commandments, really important ones, and light commandments, not so important ones. And they basically taught that if you did the heavy ones, you could let the light ones go. Now that sounds pretty, pretty good deal, right? And honestly, isn't that how we function today? Well, at least I never murdered anybody. Well, yeah, it might have been a little white lie, but I did it because I wanted to spare their feelings. I mean, we rationalize all the time, and, and so what we're doing in our minds is we're saying, well, this is a biggie. Don't do that one. And this is, nah, that's not such a big deal got to be honest with you as a human being I like that because then I get to be in charge of what what state I'm in 
I get to I get to be the one that decides whether I'm standing okay with God or I'm not standing okay with God. The only problem with that is that is not how God sees his commandments because all of his commandments are based on his character. And when we break his law, when we break his commandments, we are going against his character. He is the objective lawgiver. And he says to us, I wouldn't put it in there if it weren't important. If it weren't something I didn't want you to know about and to live by. The truth is, we only need to break one law, whether it's heavy or light, to have a problem with God. This is the way James says in James 2.10, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. Have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever had a lust, lustful thought? By your own admission, you're a lying thief with an adulterous heart. Aren't you glad God is gracious? I am. And the thing is, God is not saying to you, you're condemned, you're judged. He's saying to you and to me, see yourself as you, as you really are. Because I already see you that way. But guess what? You don't need to stay that way. I have come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. And that's what he wants us to understand. So Jesus very quickly summarizes all of the Old Testament in two simple commands. The first is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. That's what we read in Matthew. When you read this in Mark, he adds strength. So what he's saying is, here's the first thing you need to do. The thing that's going to fulfill the, the entirety of the, of the law is summed up in this one thing, first of all. Love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. So to love God with your heart is to love with the totality of your inner self. To love him with complete integrity. That is, your outsides match your insides. To love him with everything you have pretty much covers it, right? But Jesus wants us to understand, and this all comes from the law of Moses, by the way. He wants us to understand that, that, that there's not a part of us that's not covered in this love of God that we're supposed to have. Love God with the totality of yourself. That's what it means to love Him with your heart. To love Him with your soul is to love with everything, the essence of your thoughts and your feelings. To love Him with your mind goes beyond just your thinking. It goes into your understanding, to your intelligence, to your reasoning. To love God with your strength is not limited to our physical abilities. To love Him with our strength means to love Him as much as we can. To love Him with everything that we can. We are to love God with every single thing that we have and are. It is a whole being sort of love. It's all about Him. The second commandment tells us that we are supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, then Jesus says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two things. In other words, you want to know what the Old Testament was all about? Two things. Love God with everything you have and love others just as you love yourself. Now, when Mark retold this, this same incident, this confrontation Jesus had with the lawyer where he responded, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, he points out that this lawyer that he's talking, that is talking to Jesus says something very interesting to Jesus. He says, Jesus, you got it. You've summarized it all well. And then he says, to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now Jesus didn't even say anything about the sacrificial system. 
This guy was, was driving the point that Jesus made back to the implication. And here's what we need to understand. God is not interested in your sacrifices. God does not need our offerings. He does not need any of the things that we might do externally to show everyone else just how religiously righteous we are. What God wants is our entire being, our love, our minds, our hearts, our intellect, our physicality, everything to line up under this one thing. Love God. Love Him with everything we have. Interestingly enough, this lawyer, this guy who was well-versed in, in the Old Testament, he was one that, as you read through the three different Gospels that, that share this particular incident, he was one that the, the religious leaders had kind of prodded and said, hey, go ask him this question. The light began to dawn for this guy. He began to understand what Jesus was saying. And that's not the outcome that the religious leaders wanted. And it so rattled them that as Mark comes to the end of this incident in Mark chapter 12, verse 34, it says, from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. They were done. Jesus gave them answers that no one else could give them. Jesus interacted with them in such a way that it was, it was compassionate and kind, and yet it was truthful. He was the perfect balance of grace and truth. And what, what happened with this guy was that he, as he experienced Jesus in the honesty and integrity of his own heart, interacting with the Word of God, it had an impact on him. There's a point in this, I think, for us. I think a mind and heart that is open and truly seeking God will have a much different response to time spent with Jesus in God's Word. A heart that is truly open to seeking after God will have a much different experience with the Word of God. So, if you're struggling with God, you're here and you're like, you know, I just don't even know that God is real, that He's there, if He is there, who He is. If you're struggling, I want to ask you to do yourself a favor. Come to the Bible with, a, with the heart of a child and ask God to show Himself to you, to reveal Himself to you. Maybe you've got a friend who's struggling with this very thing. Issue that challenge to them. And just say, you know, if you'll go to God with an in integrity of heart, and you'll just ask Him to reveal Himself to you, He will show up in a really personal, powerful way. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength. Now, this concept of love is where a 21st century Christian might get hung up. To love God is not to simply have feelings of love for Him. True love involves our minds. It involves our emotions. It involves our will. It involves our thoughts. It involves our service. It involves our obedience. Even when we don't have or maybe we've lost that love and feeling. It's not about our feelings, it's about our commitment, because love is a commitment. And here's where this gets really intensely intrusive and messy. It's one thing to consider what it looks like for us to love God. It's something different to consider that my love for God cannot be divorced from my love for others one naturally flows from the other. So the entire law, all the first five books of the Old Testament, they call it the Torah as well. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All the books that Moses was involved in, in, in writing for the people of Israel and for us today hang on these two simple statements. Love God with everything you have. Love your neighbor just as you love yourself. 
The Apostle Paul picks up on this in Romans when he says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Get that? The one who loves fulfills the law. How does living by what the law says demonstrate my love for others? Now, this is, this is one that I tripped over for a long time. I grew up in an independent, fighting, fundy Baptist church. We had all of our rules, and if you lived by those rules, then you were right with God. And if someone else didn't live by those rules, well, then we didn't hang out with them. And what was happening in my life was I was looking great on the outside, but on the inside, my heart was treacherous toward God. So how in the world can living by the law help me love other people? Well, we understand that the law itself helped us realize that, that we, we could never measure up to God's standard. But listen to what the law says for us to do. Because if we did, were able to do these things, then we would truly be loving other people. Again in Romans 13. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Get that? What he's saying is, when you love someone, you won't sleep with their spouse because you love them. And you want them to experience the fullness and the depth of love with their spouse. If you love someone, you won't kill them because you want them to live. If you love someone, you won't steal from them because you're glad that they get to have nice things. And if you love them, you will not covet or, or, or desire to take from them the things that they have because you're glad that they've been blessed. That's why fulfilling the law will enable us to love other people because God's showing us how to love other people. But we miss the point if we just stay there. So Jesus starts with, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What is he saying? What is the, the core thing that he wants us to understand about from this passage? How you treat others is not the truest measure of how much you love others. How you treat others is the measure of how much you love God. See, sometimes as believers, we feel like our right belief allows us to look down on other people who don't believe the same way we do. Our right belief allows us to, to marginalize people that don't agree with us, that don't think about things the way we do. And when we do that, we're showing that our right belief is in our head, but it's not in our love. Because loving God means that I will love others as I love myself. 1 John 4.19, John says, We love because he first loved us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. So, the cure for apathyism is to grow in my love for God. How do I do that? How do I grow in my love for God? God would never tell us to do something that he has not equipped us with the, the resources to, to accomplish. So Jesus is saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. He's going to enable us. He's going to equip us. Keep that in the back of your mind for just a moment because I want to tease another thought out for just a second. I have one simple application for us this week. Something that every single one of us can do. One thing that we can all do that demonstrates our love for God by loving others enough if we will do it. Tell someone this week about Jesus and what he's done for you. Tell someone this week about Jesus and what he's done for you. 
Tim Hall, one of our elders and a good friend, told us at the Tuesday morning prayer meeting last week about a friendship that he had with, with a guy whose name many of you will know. His name is Bill Bright. Bill Bright started Campus Crusade for Christ. It's just called Crew now. Um, many of our, our mind students are involved at Crew. And um, he said that Bill Bright was not the best preacher. And he really was not the best author. But he said Bill Bright was, was the guy that when you were around him, he'd say, Tim, let me tell you about Jesus. I love him. He's the first person I talk to each day. I share my dreams, my life, my everything with him. Is that how you are with Jesus? I have to be honest. As God has been working me over with this message, it's not me every day. A lot of times every day, I'm, I've got my nose to the grindstone. I've got stuff that I've got to do. I've got a sermon to prepare. I don't have time to tell people about Jesus. Come on now, I'm not the only one. One of my good friends in the church here, uh, Rudy Rydberg, and if you don't know Rudy, you need to meet Rudy. He is an incredible man of God. Rudy, where are you? There he is. He's probably going to kill me for this because he do not want to be embarrassed. <laughs> Rudy went through a very uh, difficult time recently. And instead of making, allowing that to close him up, almost every Sunday, Rudy comes up to me and he says, you know what? God opened another door for me to tell someone about Jesus. And he used a tragedy. He told me this morning three stories out of the gate of how God opened a door and he simply walked through. And all he does is he tells them about his love for Jesus. Now, another friend that I hope you know, and if, you, if not, hopefully you get to know him um, today, Jim Tilden is in the back there. Jim, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand so everyone can see you. Jim uh, and I talked on the phone this last week, and he told me about something that I wanted him to share with you all about how he shares his faith and in even a tragic situation for himself. Go ahead, Jim. A um, little that, closer to your mouth. There we go. Is that, is that good? Can you hear Perfect. me now? Okay. Uh, it's been a, almost two, be two weeks on Tuesday. Uh, I started to catch the flu, and so my daughter took me to the emergency room at the at St. Anthony's. And said, oh, they turned me around and sent me back home. Well, the next day, I got worse. And it was, it was pretty bad. Uh, when I got there, they just rushed me through up to ICU and I spent five days there. But the first night <coughs> uh, I heard the doctor and the nurses say, I don't think he's going to make it through the night. Mm -hmm. I had developed uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Blood sugars are supposed to be 109 and mine was a thousand. <coughs> so anyway, uh, laying there I thought, uh, I don't want to die, but uh, if I do die, I know it'll be with Jesus and I'll get to see my wife again. That's exciting. But I said, Lord, I, I want to do something. I, I don't want to go out like this. I want to do something. So I just totally relaxed in his hands and said, you know, we, we've been studying in the life class about Paul and Acts. And I started reading in Romans and, and other things with Paul. And I said, make me like Paul where he was totally sold out to you so that you know I can tell somebody about Jesus if this is it. So anyway, they got that under control, and then I got pneumonia. Then they got that under control, I got the flu. Then they got that under control, I got strep throat. I said, Lord, are you, uh, you know, like Paul, I don't, I don't want to take any shifts because I don't want to be in a shipwreck, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I, as I said, I just relaxed. And I said, Holy Spirit, just just do whatever you have to do so that I can tell somebody about Jesus. And uh, the best uh, the best description I can tell you is it felt like Pentecost. My spirit just got on fire. And the next day they got start, started getting stuff under control. And people started coming in my room, the nurses, to check on me about every 10 minutes to take blood and everything. And, and I, I said to this one gal, said, uh, what's your name? She told me. I said, uh, I said, you know, you guys are incredibly talented. And I said, do you, do you know Jesus? And she said, what? 
Jesus? And she said, uh, I don't know. So I began to share the gospel with her. Well, then another nurse came in, and the same thing. And I went through probably six nurses and several CNAs, but the neatest one was my, my doctor. She came in, and she was a Pakistani woman, and she sat on the edge of my bed, and she said, Mr. Tilden, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine. And she said, uh, well, what, what's, what's going on? How do you feel and everything? And I said, you know, I said, the Lord has taken care of me through this. And I looked at her and I said, are, are you a Muslim? And she said, yes, I am. She said, my father brought us to this country to get away from all of the bloodshed and killing in Pakistan so that we could have a life here. And I said, and you're a doctor? And she said, yeah. And I said, do you know Jesus? And she said, what? <laughs> I said, do you know Jesus? And she goes, no, tell me. So I had an opportunity to share the gospel with this brilliant young woman. And I told her how talented and, and, and everything. I said, wouldn't it be great if you, uh, uh, you know, when, when you're struggling with a patient to, to tell them uh, something horrible or that you'd have somebody to, to go to to take that burden off of you. And anyway, I talked to her for 20 minutes. And she said, well, that was a beautiful story. And I said, no, no, it wasn't a story. I said, it's my life. I said, and, and you can have that same life. And you can have it not only here abundantly, wouldn't that be great to look forward to? And she didn't know what to say. She said, well, I got to go do my rounds. I said, okay. But, but the whole, I was there five days, but I had an opportunity to share the gospel with, with literally everybody. I don't know if they thought I was crazy, but, you know, but, but it, it was just so neat. Uh, as I told Pastor Lynn, I got out of the way let the Holy Spirit work. Amen. And, you know, it was, it was just wonderful. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Wouldn't it be great if every one of us had a story like that? There's not a reason in the world we can't. Some of us will have stories if, if we choose to to share Jesus with somebody this week. Some of us will have stories of, oh man, they shut me down. <laughs> or, yeah, they asked me a question I didn't know the answer to. But you know what? Once you get out into the water and you, and you begin to do this, you, you realize that uh, if I surrender to the Spirit of God like Jim did, He will work through me. This is not our work. It's His work. Jesus came to accomplish this work and he left us here to carry it on. It's his work. This is his church. You're his people. We are his people. And we bear his message. To love God does not mean that you don't love anyone else. It does mean that your love for God does not get eclipsed by your love or your commitment to anything or anyone else. You prefer him. You choose him. Your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, all the bases are covered, are always toward him. And what do we do with things we love? What do we do with people we love? We talk about them. We talk about them. So, back to loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. What's that look like? I want to challenge each and every one of us to consider this week, do I love Jesus enough to share him with somebody, to talk about him, just to talk about him? And if not, that is your emphasis for prayer this week. God, why don't I love you like that? God, what is in my heart that's keeping me from you? What have I set there 
that is in the place of first priority for you or in your place. So a challenge for every single one of us. And not this, my purpose is not guilt or shame. Uh, guilt and shame as a motivation is not productive. Guilt is the gift that keeps on giving, as Irma Bombeck likes to say, but it is not productive for spiritual things. I want to challenge us to begin a spiritual conversation this week. Begin a spiritual conversation this week. I don't mean you've got to share the full gospel and you've got to close the deal. Just talk about Jesus. So the first thing to do this is ask God to open my eyes to his opportunity this week. Ask God to open my eyes. Now, for those of us whose, whose love is not burning hot, instead of asking God that, ask him, what, am I, what have I placed in your place that's keeping me from loving you? Reveal that to me. And, and if you have to, just spend the whole week doing that and listening to God. Open up the scriptures. Read through them. Read. You can even just start where we just looked at today, Matthew 22, 38 to 40. And just spend time with God asking him about that. Second, after you ask him to open your eyes, think and pray about what Jesus has done for you. What's Jesus done for you? It could be something he's done for you recently, like in Jim's case. It could be that you just want to be able to tell your story. So the, the simplest way to tell your story is to think about your life in three sections. Life before Christ, how I came to Christ, and since I came to Christ, how's he been working in my life? We all have a story. And one of the reasons we don't share our faith is because we're afraid someone's going to ask us a question we can't answer. Well, nobody can argue with your story. If you experienced this, you experienced it. If Jesus is real to you, he's real to you. Now, they can question the validity of such a claim, but at least the story is out, and maybe a relationship can begin where you can discuss this with them. Life before Christ, how I came to Christ, life after Christ. And then one of the things that can be really difficult is how do I get into the conversation? Jim had a ready-made situation, but most of us wouldn't have done that. He was thinking that way, praying that way, asking that way. So I think a third thing that we need to do is decide ahead of time a simple question that you could use to begin the conversation. What's a simple question that I could use? I want to give you five or six. First could be, do you have any spiritual beliefs? Do you have any spiritual beliefs? Many people don't want to be, be called a Christian or be, become a Christian, but they are spiritual. And that most people are happy to discuss those. A second question could be, how would you describe your spiritual journey? You're just engaging them on the level of, of their own personal journey, their own personal experience. A third one could be, to you, who was Jesus? That can open up a door for you to say, well, to me, he's, he's this. But here's the thing in any of these questions. Don't be thinking about your response. Listen well. Ask questions and listen some more. Don't speak unless they're not. But break that rule often because sometimes silence is, has the strongest voice. You're there because you love God and you love them. And you want to share your love for God with them. Another question could be, what do you think happens after death? What do you think happens? You're not making a declaration. You're not doing anything but asking a simple question. The last question, and there's plenty of others. You could Google this and come up with lots of others. What's most influenced you to be where you are on your spiritual journey? Why are you where you are on your spiritual journey? So if I were to summarize the, the whole of what I think the challenge of this passage is today, it is to love God and others by sharing your love for God with others this week. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the way you've worked in every one of our lives to bring us to this place today. 
Lord, there are people that you want to hear about yourself this week. People that'll be riding the bus with us. People that'll be sitting next to us in class. People that'll be um, walking through life, whether it's a neighbor or a coworker or a friend in a, a sports league. Wherever they are, whoever they are, bring those people to our minds, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you'll prompt us with the right entree into a conversation with them. And Lord, if, if our hearts are not toward doing this, if, if we are allowing our fear to keep us back, Lord, I pray that you'll speak to us this week, that we'll open our hearts and minds to you and invite you into that place of fear or into that place of anxiety or indecision. And I pray that you'd, you'd minister to us right there. Thank you that you love us so much that you died for us and that you invite us to be involved in such an important